In this video, I will explain why you should never reuse an IOTA address for outgoing transactions. Digital signatures are used for authentication, integrity checking, and non-repudiation. The development of quantum computers threatens the security of currently used digital signature algorithms, such as RSA and elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. Cryptographers developed a variety of quantum resistant alternatives, of which hash-based signatures are the most promising. Hash-based signatures are based on so-called one-time signatures. The term implies that a single public-private key pair must only be used once. Otherwise, an attacker is able to reveal more parts of the private key and spoof signatures. In 1979, Leslie Lamport created a method to construct digital signatures using only cryptographically secure one-way hash functions. This method is called the Lamport Signature or Lamport One-Time Signature Scheme. Other one-time signature schemes are the Merkle OTS and Winternitz OTS. The Lamport One-Time Signature Scheme is very easy to understand and is very loosely comparable to Winternitz OTS. For simplicity's sake, I will be using the Lampert one-time signature scheme explaining why you should never reuse an IOTA address for outgoing transactions. So let's begin. Alice uses a random number generator and produces two pairs of 256 random numbers, total 512 numbers. These are the two pairs. Pair 0 with 256 random numbers and pair 1 with also 256 random numbers. Each random number is 256 bits in size. These random numbers forms the private key. Each of the 512 random numbers are separately hashed using, for example, SHA-256. These hash random numbers forms the public key. So each of these random numbers in the previous slides are now hashed, and these hash random numbers forms the public key. Alice has a document or transaction data, which is hashed using SHA-256. The document hash is of course 250 bits long. This is a representation of a hashed value. I'm only showing you the first three bits and the last three bits. Alice wants to create a digital signature for her document. She applies the following procedure. Loop through each bit n of the hash from 0 to 255. She loops through each of these bits. If the bit is a 0, publish the nth number of pair 0. If the bit is a 1, publish the nth number of pair 1. When all bits are looped, destroy all unused numbers from pair 0 and 1. This produces a sequence of 256 random numbers. In the next slide, I will explain these steps. This is Alice document hash. And this is the private key she generated. She loops through each bit of the hash. Bit number 0 has value 1. She looks at pair 1 and she selects this random number. This is bit number 1. Bit number 1 has value 0. She looks at pair 0 and this is bit number 1. She takes this value. Bit number 2 has the value 1. She looks at pair 1 and she selects this random number. This is bit number 253. Bit number 253 has the value 0. She looks at pair 0, and she takes this random number, and so on. The selected random numbers forms a digital signature. The digital signature consists of 256 bits. As you can clearly see, the digital signature consists of half of the private key. So the private key consists of total 512 bits, but only half of the private key is used in the digital signature. After the digital signature is created, delete all unused numbers from the private key. These unused numbers are not used and are deleted. The digital signature consists half of the private key. The other 256 random numbers are still unknown and thus nobody can create signatures that fit other message hashes. Alice sends her document together with the corresponding digital signature and public key to Bob. Alice sends the digital signature. Please remember, 
the digital signature consists of half of the private keys, and she sends the public key. Bob wants to verify Alice's document signature. He first hashes the document using SHA-256. The document hash is again this value. Bob follows the same steps when Alice created the digital signature, but instead uses the public key. He starts with bit number 0. Bit number 0 has value 1. He looks at pair 1 and selects this hash number. This is bit number 1. Bit number 1 has value 0. He looks at pair 0 and selects this hash number. This is bit number 255. Bit number 255 has the value 1. He looks at pair 1. This is bit number 255 and he selects this hash number. Bob produces a sequence of 256 hashes picked from Alice's public key, as I demonstrated earlier. Bob now hashes each of the random number in the digital signature. Bob has received this digital signature from Alice, and Bob will hash each of these random numbers, as indicated here. If both sequence of hash numbers match, then the signature is OK. If this sequence match this sequence, then the signature is OK. The Lampert signature creates a digital signature which reveals part of the private key. The private key has 512 numbers and using it once will reveal 256 numbers. Using the private key twice weakens the security of the scheme again by half. The probability of an attacker being able to successfully forge a signature for a given message increases from 1 over 2 to the power of 256 to 1 over 2 to the power of 128. A third signature using the same key would increase the probability of a successful forgery to 1 over 2 to the power of 64, and a fourth signature to 1 over 2 to the power of 32, and so on. Please note IOTA's signature scheme is based on the Winternitz one-time signature scheme and is not the same as the Lampert signature scheme. However, by using the Lampert one-time signature scheme, I am trying to give you a very simplistic understanding why you should never reuse an IOTA address for outgoing transactions. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe. If you have questions, leave your comments below. I'll do my best to answer them.